Good morning. At the title for today's sermon, Crush for Iniquities, Isaiah 53. It used to be a Good Friday service, since we don't normally celebrate, or in a sense that to have a Good Friday service, this will be a very good time for us to meditate this passage in the Old Testament. We call that the Gospel of the Old Testament. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a hairy and difficult passage that you have given us this morning. It is hairy because it speaks to us that you have sent your beloved son to die for our sins. It is difficult because we can never fully understand how you would want to exchange your precious and sinless son as a substitute for a wretched person like me. So convict us, O mighty God and Heavenly Father. Speak that we may understand. Speak that we may respond back to you, not just with our head, but with our heart and with our hand. Take over this pulpit and speak through me. Forgive me for my limited understanding of your word and pardon me from my lack of eloquence of speech. We pray this in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen. Well, I'd like to ask all of you a question. The Lord has promised to send his anointed servant. And we read last week that it was Cyrus that the Lord has referred to, that the Bible has referred to, to deliver his would-be exiled people in Babylon. Remember, Isaiah was writing and was speaking to the people in exile when he was only more than 150 years before that is going to happen. So Isaiah was prophesying, speaking to the people that would already be in the exile. And Isaiah writes that they will be comforted because the Lord is going to send an anointed servant of his, Cyrus, a Gentile, a king of Persia to deliver them. But what? about their spiritual bondage and deliverance. How will they be saved? Well, many people agree that Isaiah resembles a miniature Bible. Firstly, there are 66 chapters, just like the Bible has 66 books. Secondly, the first 39 chapters resemble the 39 books in the Old Testament. And the next 27 chapters resemble to that of the 27 books of the New Testament. And finally for today, that I'd like to share that there are four songs on the servant of the Lord, just like there are four Gospels in the New Testament. We preached on this pulpit two Sundays ago, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 to 9, talking about the servant of the Lord who will be a gentle person who will not lift up his voice or cry out. For this week, although we did not have a chance to preach on Isaiah 49 that we read on Tuesday, verse 1 to 7, and Isaiah 50, verse 4 to 9, that we would have read that on Thursday, and today, on this very Sunday morning, that for those of you who have done your quiet time reading, you would have read today's passage, Isaiah 52, verse 13 to Isaiah 53, verse Well, let me continue to give you the structure that for these 15 verses, it is best to divide them, to divide them into five stanza. First, the startling servant. 
Isaiah 52 verse 13 to 15. Then the sorrowful servant, Isaiah 53 verse 1 to 3. The suffering servant, verses 4 to 6. And the silent servant, verses 7 to 9. And the satisfied servant, verses 10 to 12. The main idea for today's uh, 15 verses is the Lord has laid the sins of His people on His substitutive servant who is sinless, the servant who was crushed for their iniquities, thereby making them righteous. And the servant is satisfied to see the success of the will of the Father. Substitutive. The sinless servant become our substitute and face the wrath and the judgment of the Lord because not of his sin, but because of our sin. And it is the Lord's doing. He has laid our sin on his sinless servant. The Lord has crushed him because of our iniquities and of our transgression. And through the crushing, the Lord justify us. So his servant makes sinful people to be accounted as righteous. The substitutive servant is satisfied to have achieved success after he had done the will of the Lord, of his Father God. Let me help you to expand Isaiah 53 for your understanding and prayerfully for your conviction. The startling servant, or some call it the astonishing servant, the shocking, surprising, unexpected servant. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. Who is speaking here? The Lord Yahweh is speaking here. The word wisely. Well, wisely and understanding is the most used translation of the Hebrew word behind. But the same Hebrew word can also be translated as prosper, success, and successfully. In the New American Standard Bible, the same Hebrew word is translated as prosper. Behold, my servant shall prosper. In the left Sam English Bible, it is translated as achieving success. Look, behold, my servant shall achieve success. I agree more with the Left Sam English Bible in this particular context itself. The Lord speaking, Behold, my servant shall act successfully. High and lifted up, a phrase used by Isaiah to refer to Yahweh. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 to 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Isaiah does not refer to the way that the servant of the Lord is going to die, to die on the cross. But Isaiah is pointing to us the close association and equality of the servant of the Lord to the Lord himself. Both the servant and the Lord are described as high and lifted up. And he, the Lord's servant, shall achieve success shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, astonished, startled, shocked, why his appearance was so marred and beyond human semblance and recognition. Well, perhaps this has reference to his pre-crucifixion appearance after he was beaten. Anyway, Jesus is, in my understanding of the Bible, likely to be very ordinary looking when he was among the people of Israel. Well, perhaps he may have strong arm because of his vocation as a carpenter, a 16 to 18 inches bicep compared with an average person of 13 to 14 inches. But in more way or so, he was ordinary. He was able to walk through the crowd. Visit the temple and no one can really tell that he is the servant of the Lord. 
Jesus was so ordinary that the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, need an insider to point to them who Jesus was when they sent the temple guard to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was ordinary looking. Yet, verse 14, it is not the end of the sentence. Many were astonished, were shocked, were startled at the servant because nations all over the world will be in awe, taken aback, so say the, the Message Bible. The word, the Hebrew word behind sprinkle is nasa. It is a very difficult to be translated. Most of the time, as it is even being here in the ESV, it is being translated as sprinkle, splash, or spattle. So most people would have read this and interpret that as the servant of the Lord has sprinkled and cleansed the sin of the nation. But progressively, more and more commentator has understand that the Hebrew behind perhaps has the another meaning in this particular context to cause to spring to leap in joyful surprise and to startle many nations. This servant of the Lord, whom many have considered not important at all, will eventually surprise, shock them when they finally see and understand about him. What was beneath the mud appearance? The servant's mud appearance at the beginning will be changed into an exalted, glorified uh, picture, a glorified person, a divine person, a glorified God when he is coming again to be the king of the kings and the lord of the lords. Many who have not been told, they see now. And whoever that have not heard, they now understand with their own eyes, what was unthinkable that will have right before them, they now understand. This is the servant of the Lord. The one that has marked appearance is actually, will be the glorified God in his second coming. So, if I may summarize the first three verses of today's passage, the startling servant is exalted. He is high and lifted up. Even though his mouth beyond normal looking, he will start to shock many nations, causing them to be surprised when he is revealed again at the end of the age. The first three verses of Isaiah 53. And this is where that now we understand what the marking of the Bible Breaking them, breaking them out into chapter and verses itself may not be exactly accurate because this passage of Isaiah 53 should not have started from Isaiah 53 verse 1. It should have started three verses before that. So the next stanza, I entitled it The Sorrowful Servant. Isaiah wrote a rhetorical question. Who has believed? what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. The Lord has revealed the coming of his Son to serve us. His first coming is to save and to deliver the, his people from the spiritual bondage. It was understood by the humble fisherman. It was understood by the tax collector. It was understood by the ordinarily poor. He, it was understood by the women who bled for 12 years, but not for the proud chief priest, not for the temple official. They don't believe what they have heard. They don't believe what they have seen. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. A change of speaker here from I to we. From the Lord who is speaking to we, the sinful people, Isaiah identified himself with the Jewish people 750 years later, right up to the first century AD. He travels back to the future that the servant, humble beginning, born in a manger, 
growing up in a small village, not even Jerusalem, not even in Sephora, the capital city of Galilee, like a root out of dry ground, not the fertile land. No form, no majesty, no beauty that we should have a second look at him. He is not desire. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. John chapter 1, verse 11. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteem him not. On the day that he was crucified on the cross, his disciples ran away except John, together with his mother, Mary, and together with a few others, women, that had been following him. He was despised and rejected by men. So, as I group them into the sorrowful servants, the three points that I wanted to share with you, that to help you to remember that first, the servant of the Lord is unexpected undesired and rejected. He was unexpected. Perhaps unexpected is not a correct description. It is more likely they choose not to believe that the first anointed servant, Cyrus, coming as a conqueror with a mighty army, and yet now another appointed anointed person coming as a babe, born in a manger, living in a small little town in Nazareth. In John chapter 1, verse 46, Nathanael, when he was first told by Philip that Jesus saw him and called him out, Nathanael says to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was undesired. We talk about it like a dry, like a root out of a dry ground. A spirit filled person, a divine person, incarnated yet. The place that he was born was a place that is full of sin and wretched people without majesty and form and beauty. He was rejected, despised and rejected by man. The third stanza, the key stanza of this entire passage of 15 verses itself, the suffering servant. When I first contemplating and praying, for an appropriate title for today's message, the title, The Suffering Servant, first came to my mind. And as I am reading up and meditating on these 15 verses, these three verses itself form at the Chiastic Cross, the center part, the middle third out of the five stanza, became to be the very heart of today's passage. And most of you would have already read these three verses itself, not in Isaiah, not in the Old Testament, but in the Gospel. In the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, and Gospel of John. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Many people would have considered that when Jesus died on the cross, he was dying because of his own sin. He was cursed because of his sin. They never really understand that he died on the cross is because of the sin of the people. Isaiah was not just writing to the people, Jewish people in the Babylonian exile in the future, 150 years later. He was like writing to a group of us looking back to what was happened into the past. It is not back to the future as far as Isaiah is concerned. He was writing as if he was in the year one first century, looking back together with the people as what has Jesus have done. It is like us reading back to the events that happened two thousand years ago. He was he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrow, esteem him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. These words should speak more than just to our emotion. 
especially for us who have believed. But rather, I like to emphasize the word healed. And with his wounds, we are healed. From a past tense, completed. And now we come to the present tense. That all of us, our wounds are healed because of what happened 2,000 years ago. Our wounds are healed and we have been forgiven because he was pierced 2,000 years ago. In exchange of his chastisements, we receive peace. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who has laid our iniquity on him? The Lord. The Lord has laid the iniquity of us, the sinful man, onto his sinless anointed servant. So Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, the suffering servant. He was smitten, afflicted by God, not because he has sinned, but because of us. He was crushed, pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. He was a substitute. He was a substitute, substituting our sin. He substituted our place of being judged and condemned. Just like the song just now our deacon Hannah has sang, have led us into worship at his feet. Grace and wrath meet together. Mercy and wrath meet together. He becomes our substitute. He is the substitutive servant of the Lord. His death is a substitution to the death that we deserve. But because He died for our sin, because of His suffering, that we are healed. The silent servant, He opened not His mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. The imagery would have tell us, would have told us that he did not defend himself even though he is sinless. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression, the word oppressed, oppression, afflicted, keep coming out in this passage itself. And judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who was considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. He was murdered, he was killed, he was crucified, stricken for the transgression of my people, so say the Lord. And they made his grave with the wicked. He died as a so-called considered to be a criminal. Died next to two thieves and two robbers. Yet with a rich man in his death. Most people, all people who have who has been crucified on, on the cross itself will be thrown and into the so-called buried together with all the so-called criminals. Yet, Isaiah, written 750 years ahead of the time, to say that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he would be laid on a rich man's tomb. Joseph Arimathea was being prophesied, was being foretold that he would be the one to give up the newly carved up tomb to be laid the precious Lord Jesus' body itself. Although he had done no violence, he was sinless. There was no deceit in his mouth, and yet he was crucified. He died on behalf of us. But he was not buried together with the wicked. He was laid in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah 53 verses 7 to 9, The silent servant, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth to defense, to ask, why me? He was killed. He was cut off the land of living. He was crucified. He did not open his mouth. 
He was buried to be, although he was supposed to be buried with the condemned, the two thieves, yet he was laid to rest in the rich man's tomb. And finally, the fifth stanza, Isaiah 53 verses 10 to 12. As I was reading this familiar passage again, this was the new understanding that the Lord has revealed to me and I'd like to share that with you. It's the word, the satisfied servant. Mind you, he was a suffering servant. We were familiar, we are all familiar with that. And yet now, we read that again, that he is a satisfied servant. Why? Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. Very subtly written in the passage in the Old Testament, 750 years before the event actually happened, that his death is not the end of the story. His death is not the end of the servant of the Lord. He shall be resurrected. He shall see his offspring. He shall see his followers. He shall see his disciples. He shall prolong his life. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And yes, he only served the Jews in that sense, walking in the land of the Palestine, serving the mainly the Jewish people. But his death, the good news, the complete work of this servant on this substitute servant itself and is going to be propagated to the whole world to the whole world the completed work the finished work of the lord shall prosper in his hand out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied he is a satisfied servant by his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant make many to be accounted righteous. Jesus is satisfied to see that the will of the Father is successfully carried out. In the Garden of Gethsemane, He said, Not my will, thy will be done. He is asking, praying for the cup to be removed, but He knows eventually He will have to drink the cup, the cup of wrath, so that we will not need to drink the judgment of the Lord. Jesus is satisfied to see that many can be accounted, reckoned to be righteous. Jesus is satisfied to see that now that he has and will continue receiving his inheritance, us, in the next verse, Therefore I, the Lord, say, I will divide him a portion with the many, like a Victor, like a general that has won the battle, the Lord Almighty God will be able to say that I am going to divide a portion of the spoil with him because he has faithfully done the work of the Father God. And he shall divide the spoil with the young, with the strong, because he poured out of his soul to death. And was numbered with the transgression. Yet he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I, the Lord, will reward him, will reward the servant. Why? Because he poured out his soul to death. Why? Because he was numbered, counted with the transgressors. Why? Because he bore the sin of many. These verbs are past tense. Poured out, numbered, bore. All completed. Isaiah was writing as a prophecy 750 years before the event. And yet he used the past tense to signify these things would be completed, will be fulfilled. But there is a present tense here. There is something to continue to do with the transgression with you and I. That is the servant of the Lord. That is our Lord Jesus Christ will continue and make intercession for the transgressor. That is, he will make an intercede for us today, for you and I. So, 
the satisfied servant lives on. The satisfied servant justified many to be reckoned as righteous. The satisfied servant will intercede for us. The lessons learned, the five stanza, the stuttering servant, the sorrowful servant, the suffering servant, the silent servant, the satisfied servant. And I'd like to just share three points as a summary for us. The servant's work is finished and successful. The servant was pierced and crushed by the Lord, not for his iniquity, but for the iniquities of us all. Isaiah 53 verse 5 and 10. The servant justified and count those who believe as righteous. Many are accounted as righteous because he bear their iniquities. How are, it, how are these passages itself in the Old Testament connecting to the New Testament? An Ethiopian eunuch, as he was reading Isaiah 53, verse 7 to 8, he said to Philip, the evangelist, about whom I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself, Isaiah, or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and explaining to him the scripture he told him, the good news about Jesus. This servant in the New Testament has been explained to us, referred to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. I may want to end by giving the reflection and application. Give thanks for the finished work of the servant of the Lord. The last words of Jesus in the Gospel of John John chapter 19 verse 30 was, It is finished. Jesus Christ was faithful until death to finish the work given to him by Father God. It is the will of the Father that Jesus to die and to be our substitution so that we may live forever. So give thanks to the finished work of the servant of the Lord. Believe and be saved. But that is just the beginning, not the end. We are to continue to fear the Lord and live, which is to obey His commandment in this life. However, because of our fallen nature, we continue to sin. So we give thanks that Jesus Christ, who is now seated at the right hand of God, He is interceding for us. So for today, instead of handing it back to our deacon Hannah to sing us a reflection song, I just like to want to share something more with you. And that is known as the altar call. If you are touched by Isaiah 53, I am inviting you to say the following prayer after me. For the many of you who have said this prayer before, I'd like to add that believing is a lifelong conviction. I do invite you to hold this prayer of belief in your hearts. You may choose to repeat after me to show or to show support to those who will be saying it for the first time and to show your conviction of the gift of salvation that is only available from our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Amen. And now, allow me to hand back to our deacon Hannah to lead us into singing When I Survey.